Hello and welcome to Tea and Textiles with Selvage. I'm Polly Leonard, the founder and editor of Selvage magazine and I think this is the fifth in our series of tea and textile talks on Friday afternoons when we, we finish work early and uh, today I am going to be joined by Valerie Barkowski. Valerie um, is a designer and he was featured in Selvage, um, I can't remember, it's, I think it's issue 61. Hi Valerie. Hello buddy. Hi. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Lovely, lovely to hear from you. I'm so glad you could join me today. I was just telling our readers that we featured your work back in 2015 in issue 61, I think. And we've reconnected recently because you are hoping to take part in the Selvage World Fair. Yes, um, and I'm very happy to be part of your uh, fair because I follow Selvage since 20 years. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, Sean, <laughs> can we start, Valerie, by telling me a little bit about how it all started for you? about your childhood, where you grew up, and a little bit about your education in design. Okay, so uh, I am Belgian. I am half uh, from Brussels, and um, I was grown up in the Flemish part of my country, near the sea side, in a very uh, natural environment uh, near the sea, yes, as I told already. And um, when I was 15, I went to Ghent, where I studied uh, in an art school. And then I, um, I um, further, I studied uh, interior architecture, but I must confess that all my life I was quite unhappy uh, with uh, the pedag pedagogic system, education system. Uh -huh. And uh, so I, in the second year, uh, year of my uh, interior architecture, I left school <laughs> and uh -huh. I decided to, to travel and uh, I went uh, to India. That was my first trip to India for three months. And um, people always say travel is the best education. Well, yes, I think for me it definitely was because I think, of course, well, I regret that I didn't have like um, a nice uh, that I didn't have nice teachers and a nice well a school that was adapted to me because, of course, later in my life I have met um, very nice. Uh, the people who were in the, in the education system, like um, the director of the NID school and the design school in Ahmedabad, for example, yeah. <laughs> or Francine Perron, who was the founder of uh, La Cambre Fashion. And of course, I think, okay, if I would have had people like that, I would have been a very good student. But, uh, yeah. well, it was not. And, and yes, I am quite happy of my of my adventures and what life has taught me by traveling and by learning different languages. And it gives you definitely an, an open mind and, and you're ready for a lot once you have traveled the world a little <laughs> bit, I think. So you have traveled to Russia. Yes, I have India. been living there. Yes. And to India, but you have made your home in Marrakesh. Can you tell us a little bit about those different places, what you gained from your experience living there, and why why you settled in Marrakesh. What is okay. so special about Morocco for you? Okay, so the first uh, country that learned me a lot was, of course, India. But at that time, it was not in the design field, but more in a spiritual uh, in a spiritual field. Because when you are twenty years old and you have been grown up in Belgium, in a very remote, calm place, suddenly you, you land in Bombay, Mumbai, and it's like, <laughs> you Crazy. don't know exactly what is happening to you. And uh, so these three months uh, have changed me completely. I think I was completely a different person when I came back. Then I traveled to Spain because I wanted to learn Spanish. I lived there for six months. And, uh, and later, yes, I, um, I went to Russia to live in Russia for three years where I learned another language. I learned to speak uh, Russian. And it's in that country that I started to design Bedlinen. But it was not a commercial project. It was only a personal 
necessity because at that time it was in 93 there was not much available in the in the shops so i found running meter linen and i found babushki so old ladies in the countryside who made patch I've lost you a little bit, Valerie, but I'll just wait. I think we'll come back. We'll just hang on a moment. If you just Valerie, we have just lost you. I'm going to ask you to, we're just going to wait a moment to see if the internet sorts itself out. It is a miracle, of course, that we connect at all, uh, that I can talk to you uh, from Morocco. I can see that the internet's struggling. We're just going to hang on for a couple more minutes and see if it sorts itself out. I can see we've got a spinning wheel. If not, I'm going to disconnect and try connecting again to you, Valerie. So if you just uh, hang on, we will come back to you in a moment. going to try and reconnect with Valerie. Are you, are you there? No. We're going to try again to see if uh, we can get Valerie back. I do hope we can. We're just going to drop her a quick message. Um, to let her know that we are trying again. We're going to send her a quick text. Um, Valerie, if you can still see us, just try to, here we are, try to connect again. No, nope. we're not, we're not managing it. Thank you all very much for your patience. Sometimes we have a, a little bit of a technical problem, but we are going to, we're going to try to connect uh, to Valerie by WhatsApp, and then we're going to see if she is still there. And if not, we will, we will, disconnect and try again in a moment. While, uh, while we're trying to do that, I just want to take this little opportunity to tell you about the next salvage event, which is the Japanese Petra Kutcher afternoon, which is on Saturday the 20th of March. Ah, oh, here I am. Well, I oh. still was here. <laughs> You're here, wonderful. Thank yeah. you so much. I appreciate you hanging around. No so, problem. you were telling us about your time in Russia. Yes, so I started to uh, design bed linen there uh -huh. and uh, because there, out of necessity, because there was nothing, not much available uh, in 1993. Uh -huh. And uh, I found running meter linen, then I found babushki, old ladies in the uh -huh. countryside. And I asked them to make patchworks for me and some embroidery by hand. And then also I found a woman with whom I developed a collection of um, porcelain buttons. To, to make closures for my linens. And so, so we, we were living in a dacha and so some people came to visit us and people wanted to place orders, but I was really not equipped for that. So maybe I sold a little bit, but it was not my business. I was an art dealer in uh, Russia. So I, was, I had a lot of interest for Russian art. And uh, later, 
three years later, I came to live in uh, Morocco. Uh -huh. And uh, because I had visited the country a few late uh, years before, and I completely fell in love with the country, and I decided that one day it would be, I would live here. Yeah. And uh, luckily, well, this, this moment came a few, well, five year, years later. And, um, and again, I started to make linens for my own, per, as a personal project. Yeah. But then I, I started to, um, to, to, to look to source for embroiderers, which was very complicated at that time because uh, embroidering linens was a tradition, but it was a personal and a private tradition. It was yeah. Not, yeah. It's not that you could buy linens in a, in a shop because the girls were embroidering by hand for their dories, for their trousseau. And it was a tradition that all the women, the, the younger girls and the mothers and the aunties and the grandmothers would sit at home in the afternoon and embroider. And so to make a trousseau, it could take a few years. Yes. And, and me, it took me a few years to get the right embroiderers because, well, the, it was not there. Nobody was uh, commercializing linens here. And also it was quite complicated to find the, the raw materials because nothing grows in Morocco. And with the customs, everything is complicated. So it took me three years to accomplish the, this first uh, linen collection, be uh -huh. it uh, bed, bath, and table linen. And meanwhile, and... In, the, in the cycle, uh, somebody, my assistant, one day told me, I know a, a knitting workshop, would you be interested? Uh -huh. yes. And I said, why not? And I designed a small uh, scarf on the paper she came back with samples and like this also, I started to work in the fashion world, first with scarves, then with socks. I set up a brand called Miazia that was very successful at that time. And that I sold uh, um, 14 years ago. Time is really yeah. flying. <laughs> okay. So I sold the fashion brand, I continued my, my linens. Okay. And then I was hired by a company in India to set up a brand from scratch. And oh, so, so that, that is how, so yes. You, I believe in India, you have set up two brands. Yes, and before uh, that- Bandit this, Queen yes. and Nomad. Yes. Two and brands this, with very different personalities. Could you tell us a bit about the different techniques you use for each brand yes. and how you develop their separate, uh, but both strong personalities? Okay, but to, to, to come to that point, I need to tell you that when I was okay. developing my own linens, I okay. al al already came to India because I, I was interested. I remember my trip when I was 20 and I thought, okay, now I need to go back there yes. to work. And so I started to do handmade paper there, all the packagings for my stores, some block printing, some rugs, uh, also um, loungewear. And, uh, and so that is the reason why actually that people hired me to work in India because they knew I had a knowledge, a certain knowledge of uh, craft in that country. Uh -huh. And well, probably they liked my style, they related to it. And well, also in my store in, my, in Paris, I had rickshaws, I had many, many things from that I developed in, in yeah. India. And uh, so Bandit Queen uh, came up um, like a real surprise. And for me, it was uh, like, um, a real intellectual challenge because after being uh, in Marrakech uh, in Morocco for more than 10 years, having stopped my huge business, I was like wondering, well, am I still able to do something else? I was, yeah, you know, yeah. when you are younger, your ego has some, well, <laughs> disturbances. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and so I, I was really like thrilled that somebody asked me to set up a whole brand from f philosophy to products and everything. So brand identity. And so with Bandit Queen, I landed up in a, in a company, the company of Sunita Namjoshi, Synergy Lifestyle, who is uh, producing a lot for companies all over the world. And um, so uh, Sunita has a huge knowledge of uh, textiles and craft and techniques, and also access to a lot of raw materials. And for me, after coming uh, from Morocco, where you know you work with bits and bytes, it was like a Christmas present. I was like, when I asked for a cotton, she said, but what do you want? Which construction? And, I, and there was a table full of samples and I could just choose. When I needed a ribbon, she said, but 
don't go to the market. Tell me what you need. We'll make it for you. And so for Bandit Queen, I, I really developed a lot. Uh, how would I say? It was a very sophisticated uh, craft. So we did some weaving. We worked with tie and dye. We worked with block printing. We worked a lot also with, this, with pleats, with very little pleats. Uh -huh. And like uh, in the pleats, for example, we had a bed cover that took 40 days to, to be made. It was really mm -hmm. a very, very sophisticated craft. But and with like, a, a link to India, the very fine pleats. Uh, you see I don't know. In... No? Yes, somewhere. Yes, there was always when I work, I, I always take inspiration from the country where I go, but I give it always a twist. Yes. So, there definitely was always an inspiration from India in Bandit Queen. For example, I worked with the Lucknow embroidery, the chicken curry, oh, yes. which is a very, yes. But so to do that, I went to Lucknow, I sat with women, I wanted to understand every embroidery stitch and to develop my own. And so we embroidered uh, the logo of Bandit Queen, for example, in the, in the chicken curry, Lucknow embroidery. So also, uh, I wanted to make particular uh, terry towels. And so it was, I thought it was easy to make in a, in a factory, but actually we never managed. And at the end, all the towels were woven by hand, which was quite impressive for me yes. because, and also it was impressive to have a client who could hold on and say, okay, you have an idea. I know it's possible to do it because she knew the, the, the textile world so well that, she, when I asked for something, she knew it was possible. And so for her, it was also like a challenge. Okay, I need to be able to do it because I know it's possible. I was not asking for something that was not possible. And so that was a very, very interesting experience. And also at that time, it's not so long ago because I started in 2008. Uh -huh. But still at that time, the high end uh, segment of the, of the buyers in India were very much still looking abroad. And so the aim was really to say, okay, see what you have in your country. We, mm -hmm. The country yes. is able to produce the most beautiful products in terms of quality after that style of course you like or not but the quality was definitely there and so, then the so irony was focused on an indian market it was not no uh, for me i couldn't focus on only on the indian market because i'm not indian and my knowledge was not not deep enough in that but of course we also um we also offered the collection to uh, foreign to foreign markets. Yes, yes. So we had uh, Joseph Diron, for example, an architect in Paris. Jacques Grange was sleeping in the Bandit Queen bed sheets ah. as well. So, yes. Wonderful. And Nomad, a, di a different brand that we also featured in the magazine. Yes, Can you absolutely. tell me a little bit about that? Well, uh, Nomad is a, is a very charming story somehow also because the owner and founder of the brand, Anouch Kotari, who maybe is listening to us, I don't know. Hello, Anuj, if you are there. He was trained as an engineer and he really had a passion, has a passion for lifestyle. Yes. And after I, I conceptualized the Bandit Queen brand, many Indians called me saying, I'm interested to work with you. And so I had many meetings and, mm -hmm. and so Anuj was one of them. And I thought, okay, I will go again to one of these meetings for nothing. But anyway, I'm polite, I'm just going. And I, I discovered a young man, he was in his early 30s, who had made a storyboard and he had his ideas. And, and I was, well, I thought, well, he's interesting, but the ideas he wanted to develop were too ambitious at that time because he wanted to make a concept story. And that was real estate in, in India and in Bombay is really out of the roof <laughs> and so we decided that okay um it would be better to set up a brand and again for this brand i had like a blank page to conceptualize the brand from scratch oh, and lovely. so that from the name to the visual identity and the products and and communication also in the beginning and anuj uh well he has picked up he became his own brand uh and it was quite funny because in the beginning, uh, well, he would come with the Louis Vuitton briefcase. And at the end, 
he would come with the canvas bag from the bazaar. Ah, there you are. And so, yes. So, and the idea of this brand that was that I wanted it to be a really Indian brand in the sense that I feel that for many, many decades, people come to India to take inspiration. And I did too. Many, all the designers almost yeah. I know have been to India. And I thought, well, let's stay in India. We stand in India and we go take inspiration everywhere else mm -hmm. in the world. So we look to Japan, to Morocco, to Africa. I, I had the idea to make a wax print, a wax, like an African wax, but with all the Indian symbols and etc. cetera, et cetera. So it was quite, uh, we revisited the muda, the, that typical stool from India yes, with yes, an, yes. an uh, ar a Indian architect, Rubel Duna. Well, it was very, well, I looked, of course, to the bazaar, to the mundane. We made candles in iron, in aluminum boxes. Yes, and, I love uh, the candles. <laughs> yeah. So it's, uh, it was for me a nice exercise because it was somehow wor working reverse also. Wonderful. And after your experience in India, uh, can you tell us a little bit, a bit about giving back, about your work with Mekong quilts in Vietnam? Yes, of course. So after Bandit Queen and Nomad, my ego was in peace somehow at a certain point <laughs> because, well, one and the other brand have had a immediate recognition somewhere. They both became settled brands. And so I thought, okay, now um, it would be nice. Uh, maybe I have some kind of talent. Maybe I was given something and maybe I could give back also. And I wanted to participate in an, um, in an NGO project. Yeah. And, um, and the opportunity came in Vietnam. I met somebody who who talked to me about an NGO who, had bad, who badly needed a creative director and a designer. And so I offered to go for three months and to help them. And so I went to Vietnam. And wow. so well, it was quite funny because I said to them, please, I don't want to go to a hotel. I want to stay in a family. <laughs> and of course, in my mind, I was going to Marguerite Duras you know, the French writer who has this beautiful wooden house with mosquito nets and fans. And no, I was in a Vietnamese family, middle class family with neon light, with tiles on the walls. And <laughs> so, well, it was very an interesting experience, very interesting. And so I have followed them up for two, three years still every week uh, to to try to make whatever sustainable in what we have worked together when I was there. Wonderful. I, I love the work. And um, at the end of this conversation, we will add links to all of the websites and the brands that we've mentioned and to Valerie, of course, to her website. So you can all uh, follow her on social media and find out more about uh, all of the things that we're discussing. So, Back, Valerie, to Marrakesh, Marrakesh. to your beautiful <laughs> Riyadh. Can you tell yeah. us about that adventure? Well, that adventure, well, to, to finish with textiles, of course, my, my home textiles, well, is my core business now. Yes. So I embroider yes. linen here since more than 20 years. Huh? And um, from a large business, I narrowed down to a smaller business. I have a store in Marrakesh yes. and now a web shop as well. And I'm quite happy to work in this kind of size of company. And, uh, and also my Riyadh, which I have since more than 20, well, 25 years. Now I bought it 25 years ago. And when I came here, that is actually what passionated me about Marrakesh. It is the architecture and the Riyadh. Because when you come from Belgium, from a very gray country, <laughs> and suddenly you have a house with, a, with four orange trees in well above your head in the patio you it's it feels cold. like but you know still after so much time when i sit in my in my large sofa in the patio i i think i am dreaming because still i now it's the the, the season of the orange blossoms and it's it's a dream still after yes. 25 years i i just love it because it's another world and uh, the riyadh is furnished with all of your own bed, bath, and table linen. Yes, with absolutely. Your, with your signature 
tassels and pom-poms. Can you tell us a little bit about that, those designs and those elements that have followed you throughout your career and have really become a, a signature? Well, it became a signature and it was also copied all over the world yes, by many, yes. many brands and huge yes. brands. But uh, it started all in 96 when I, I rented the, ho the home of Françoise Dorget, who was the founder of Caravan in Paris. Yes. And uh, she had a house in Asila. So when I settled in Marrakech through a common friend, I could uh, rent her house. And when I entered her house, I had for the first time in my life the feeling of going into my own house. That was already very specific, mm -hmm. strange. And there I discovered the tradition of all the women in the reef region who work in the fields. They all have like a, a handwoven cotton cloth with stripes on their hips. Yes. And uh, this is adorned with little, little tassels that are called shishiat here. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I, I discovered that there were vintage pieces that, and I, I started to go everywhere to every antique shop and flea market in the region. And I was supposed to be on holidays, <laughs> but I ended up like really scouting and hunting for treasures. And, and then I had the idea that, well, that is an interesting idea to transpose on bat linen. And so I, I, had, I designed a special style for that at that time. And uh, in, at that moment also, all the craft traditions in Morocco were segmented, like in India, actually. Yes. Every region has its own. And sometimes, for example, uh, Jamdani in India, you cannot find in Jaipur, for example. Well, here, it was the same situation with these little tassels. You could not find them in Marrakech. Nobody was making them. So when I started my linens, I sent all my towels to the cook. <laughs> <laughs> of Françoise Dorget, who dispatched the whole thing to all women at home in Asila. And so that is how it started. It was quite uh, interesting and charming, I must say. Wonderful. Then slowly, we started to train uh, ladies here in Marrakech. And then I had the most funny experiences also, because I gave this, and it's somehow it's well. It's furnished, but it's simple. And so one day, a woman brings me back a towel with a little cat hand embroidered in the corner of the, the towel. And I said, but Aisha, why do you embroider me a cat on my towel? She said, don't you think, madam, this looks much better? <laughs> <laughs> and this kind of anecdotes in Morocco, I have like so many. And that's what I love about this country. And I would recommend to everybody who is listening, if you want, if you don't know Morocco, and even if you know Morocco, I would suggest you to read Arabian Nights from Tahir Shah. Because Thank this you. book gives you really the edge. So it's not the Thousand and One Nights. Huh? It's the Arabian Nights from Tahir Shah. It's a contemporary book. It was written maybe 12, 15 years ago or 10 years ago. And for me, it gives you really the essence of this country and the mentality of the people here. And it's really something special. And I am still charmed by their, the people, their kindness, the way, the way they, they talk to you, the way they smile, how they think. You know, one of the first times I came to Morocco, I was in Isawiha. And at that moment, they were building uh, the tunnel uh, from uh, Europe to UK. Yeah. And I was sitting in the street with a young boy. He was 18. And he yeah. said, but Valérie, when you will be in that tunnel, will you be able to see all the fish? It will be so beautiful. <laughs> you see, they have this kind of romantic idea of life somehow. And they yes. still have that. You need to more hunt for it now because tourism, of course, is a bit yes. Yes. damaging things. But uh, still, it's really... And in my work, it's the same. I have always loved uh, Morocco and Marrakesh whenever I have visited. And just for our, our uh, listeners, uh, Valerie rents out her beautiful Riyadh. So uh, it is furnished with all of her own textiles, divinely beautiful. So if you ever have the opportunity to, uh, once the pandemic has passed, to visit uh, Morocco, I highly recommend you um, uh, write to her and arranged to rent her beautiful Riyadh. 
her store that sells all of her textile is very close by and certainly worth a visit. And so you have been at home, uh, Valerie, for the last year. Could you tell us a little bit about the portraits you've been making? <laughs> well, Finally, uh, last question. <laughs> so uh, f during the lockdown, well, one year ago, I think it was on the 17th of March, I had to go uh, to my native country, Belgium, for, uh, for personal reasons. And actually, I got stuck there uh, for, well, for a while. And um, it's quite amazing because, um, well, I know some people had difficult times during the lockdown but, sudden, lockdown, but suddenly for me, I was so free. I had a lot of time. I could only be busy with myself and with my, work, my own personal work or whatever. And uh, I was invited by, by a friend in Marrakesh, Nicole, who herself was invited by somebody in Ibiza, David Lepan, who had uh, started... Um, well, he had this initiative of a project called Meet My With Wilson. And the idea was that uh, he would ask people to make portraits with whatever, uh, inspired by the movie of, um, with Tom Hanks, which was called Cast Away, where he's on a de de des desert alone on an island. And he has a Wilson ball that he transforms in a person, person. And this becomes his companion during three years while he's there alone. And the idea was to give smiles, to, to try to help people who were lonely. And Nicole, she, she, she tagged me on Instagram saying, okay, Valérie, make a, <laughs> make a portrait. And so I immediately went to my kitchen and, I, and to my drawers and I put a few things together. I make a photo with my phone and posted it on Instagram. And immediately people were like enthusiastic about that. <laughs> and so the next day I did it again and the third day as well. And it went on for 72 days. <laughs> <laughs> and um, after a moment, well, people were really waiting for these portraits because I wanted to stop at 50. And then I, I made a list of questions. Should I stop or should I go on? And like 97% said, go on, please. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had a, a very good friend, a photographer, Anita Calero, who is Colombian, and she was following that too. And she told me, Valérie, you need to make a book. And I said, but no, this is only like photos with the iPhone and it's like something like this. She said, no, no, send me your photos and we will edit them. So um, I sent all the, the images to Colombia and we did the editing with her editor. And then two months later, everything came back. And I was with another friend, Franck Perron, who was the, the, the founder of La Cambre Fashion. And she told me, oh, well, if you want, I, I will do the, the layout of your book. And I said, but you can do that. She said, yes, I love to do that. And so I gave her a hard drive with all the portraits. OK, do what you want. And it was a free exercise for her. And she did really something beautiful and so i edited this book we published this book in 250 in a limited edition of 250 and uh and i also sell some of the of the portraits uh in a limited edition of seven but i was thinking maybe on the salvage shop maybe i could well put one on sale in a larger edition maybe a little bit smaller and cheaper That's and that would be a special idea. for you Thank in the you next so month <laughs> so you will, just for any of our, our viewers who haven't seen these portraits, what personality and character Valerie has put together from a pepper or a, a courgette or whatever was in her, her home. It was and quite they're funny. just charming and light and add, added a little humour to our, our lockdown, which was a very difficult time for many of us. So thank you so much, Valerie, for joining us. You're today. most welcome. Thank you, Polly. You're very welcome. We do these chats every two weeks on a Friday afternoon. We, st we stop work early and we take a cup of tea and we have a textile talk with someone we have featured in the magazine. So the next one of these textile talks is in two weeks' time on the 19th of March when we're talking to Francis Van Haslett who is a mohair expert and a weaver from South Africa. Mohair is the fiber of the Angora goat, 
one of the world's most ancient and sustainable natural fibers. So we invite you all to join us for that. And don't forget to put the dates in your diary for the Selvage World Fair, which will be running from the 31st of August to the 4th of September, 2021. Have a lovely weekend, Valerie, and thank you. You too, Pauline. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.